So, <clears throat> on June 3rd of this year, a great theologian named Jürgen Moltmann died. He was 98 years old, and he was best known for a book, he, for, for one of his many books, which was titled Theology of Hope. For, hope. for Moltmann, hope did not simply mean kind of a positive thinking or some kind of wishful optimism. Hope for him rested in the incarnation and in the resurrection. Meaning that hope was found, founded on God's becoming one of us. One of his quotes is, God weeps with us so that one day we might laugh with God. But hope is not just founded on this incarnation, this God with us, but also on the fact that Jesus was crucified and was raised. In other words, Jesus confronted the powers of death and defeated them. Our hope rests on the promise that we too share in this victory, in this resurrection. That, that we, therefore, can live even when the powers of death seem to overwhelm us, like waves swamping our boat. We can live our vocation, our call, which is to witness through worship, through word, through deed, to this God who works in the world, weeps in the world, heals the world, reconciles the world, serves the world, and restores the world. Now, Moltmann's message, I think, is a good entryway into the readings for today. Let's start with the whirlwind. So this passage from Job comes after a long series of speeches by Job and his friends. You might remember, it might have been a long time since you've read the book of Job, so I'll try to remind you, but you might remember that Job has endured many hardships, right? He lost his land, his resources, he's got boils that he scratches, he lost his home. Remember, the, the roof collapses on all his children, he loses them. It's really, he lost pretty much everything except his life, really more like his existence. Now his companions, one after another, try to convince him that somewhere, somehow, he must have sinned to bring this all on. Maybe he just doesn't realize it, but somewhere, maybe unconsciously, he sinned. And he should humble himself before God. But Job says, no, I'm not doing that. I, I am righteous, I'm just. I have acted mercifully and, he kept, and, and have kept myself from sin. He says, I want to see God. I want to see God face to face so that I can explain myself. And I think he probably wanted God to explain God's self to him too. So in our reading, God, Job gets his wish. There's this image of the whirlwind and God speaks from it. And then God, God evokes the, and, and, and calls us to mind the foundations of the earth and the place where the seas come from. And he calls to mind this primitive chaos and God commanding it and shaping it and corralling the sea and saying, you shall no, go, go no further and sinking the earth's pillars so that they are unshakable. And as if we read further in the book of Job, beyond the reading that we have today, God will go on to talk about the birds and about animals of the earth. And God will talk about the dew that, that falls on the inhabited land and on uninhabited lands. And God will talk about the ostrich, who does not seem to act much like a bird at all. It might be a little confusing to our human categories, but is delightful in God's eyes. The speech is meant to decenter Job and to tell him, you are not the center of the universe. That humanity itself is not necessarily the center of the universe. You're not the center of all things. There is much you do not know and cannot know. Now, admittedly, 
The book of Job is difficult, it's confusing, it's mysterious, and wonderful. But I'm not going to, and I'm not going to try to give you a quick and easy interpretation of the whole book. In fact, you may not be all that impressed by God's answer. I don't know. You know, still leaves us with why why is there suffering, right? But perhaps Job learns something about suffering and the suffering of the innocent, not just his own, but all those who seem to suffer, and we do not know why. And perhaps cannot know why. William Stringfellow, who you probably know I've been reading recently, once ended a speech he was giving to a group of Episcopalians on integration and race relations during the 1960s, before the assassinations of Martin Luther King, before civil rights laws. He said, one of the problems is that we tend to think of racism as a problem that can be solved in our hearts, inside of us, individually. But he says, creation is not simply about God and us. Creation goes beyond us. And it contains other powers and principalities. And by that he meant demonic forces. That while created, had lives of their own. And he meant by those corporations and political parties. And ideologies and social movements. All of these were actually powers. And even institutions like medicine and law and all the bureaucracies. He thought they had a kind of life of their own. And racism, he said, is grouped in with these. It's like personified, like this demonic power. It's like an incarnation of death itself. But he said, it won't win. It's... it's it's just that it is greater than individuals and individual power and human ingenuity. He didn't think the group should give up. But he did exhort them that day to weep. To weep. Now, Jesus wept. And that was probably the reference that was in the background of Stringfellow's talk. He wanted the group to realize the kind of power they were up against. The kind of power that we're all up against. Like the whirlwind and the waves and the sea that we read about in Mark's gospel. For that too evokes the chaos, the great depths, the abyss. The mighty dragon beast that God must defeat, according to the psalmist, to bring order. That chaos, Job's God says, is confined, but every once in a while it escapes its bounds and rises up to threaten us even now. Death indeed is defeated, but has not fled the scene. And so Jesus tells his disciples that they have to leave the crowds that they had just been teaching and go to the other side, across the Sea of Galilee. There they will continue this ministry, Jesus' ministry, announcing this new kingdom. He goes from the land of the Jews to the land of the Gentiles. Mark portrays this mission of Jesus as a mission to the whole world. But it is met with a mighty resistance. Strong men must be bound. So when we hear this phrase, the other side from our gospel today, let us hear in it this new community, this new world, this new kingdom that Jesus is announcing and the disciples are working for. They are going to this other side. But their travel is interrupted by the crashing of waves and the swamping of the boat. There was nothing to grasp hold of, nothing solid. All seemed lost. Now, I don't think it's hard to understand the symbolism of this storm, this feeling of being overwhelmed, being, feeling like there's no place to anchor, no mooring. Have you ever felt overwhelmed? Have you ever felt maybe like you're on a sinking boat sometimes? 
Maybe you feel that way right now. I don't know. You know. When Stringfellow exhorted the crowd to weep, he was saying, acknowledge the suffering. Acknowledge the difficulty of getting from where we are now to where we want to be. From getting from here to the other side. Acknowledge it and weep. But also know that that's not the end of the story. For Jesus wept. You know what happens next, right? Lazarus is raised. Jesus is crucified. And Jesus is raised. The story of human suffering is not over. But there are still acts of love, acts of justice. Progress, however incremental, incremental is made. I know sometimes we go forward and then it feels like we go back, kind of like the rocking of a boat in a storm. Perhaps the future is not always the way we envision it, but the kingdom does break through. We don't always know the cause of suffering. The innocent have suffered, the innocent will suffer. Tomorrow, in fact, is the celebration of John the Baptist's birthday. His life will end tragically. He's just a baby, but later he will grow up and he will lose his head because a despot was afraid of him. Despots kill, and they'll still kill. Wars rage. Social ills plague us. We suffer under heat waves and storm systems and flooding. And the reality is that the poor suffer a lot more than we do. Job learns that. Jesus wants the disciples to learn that too. So what do you do? Yes, you weep. But then you have to live. Faith is not just the promise that someday it will get better. Faith says that God is working even now to calm the chaos. We don't always know how it will turn out. But God's kingdom is coming. Our call is to recognize it and to witness to it by our own works of the kingdom. Working for justice, being charitable, loving, being truthful, being merciful, housing the homeless, showing courage in the face of resistance and persecution. But not just this. Moltmann was fond of saying that we must also be joyful. Weeping does not mean despair. It just means being realistic and then wiping your tears and rolling up your sleeves. Amen.